Uh, well, thanks for organizing this workshop and uh, there were some excellent talks and uh, I want to uh, talk about our work on learning inverse skinner dynamics for accurate high speed off road navigation on unstructured terrain. Uh, and this work is in collaboration with Chui Su Xiao and Peter Stern. So the motivation of this work essentially is this realization that high speed navigation really becomes challenging under essentially three combined conditions. If you want high accuracy, that is, if you have a specific trajectory that you want to follow, and uh, and all respects to, to Chris, I completely agree that if you want to specify your trajectory, uh, you, you might want you might not get the fastest behavior, uh, and that's where the challenge is. Uh, the second thing is that what if you uh, want to do it at the highest possible speed possible, and if you want to do it off road, which includes unstructured terrain, for example, what's shown on the right, right? So here's the problem setting that we're going to have. So what we have is that we have some desired trajectory, which we're going to feed into a controller and our controller needs to provide some controls, which after uh, running through the forward kinodynamic function in the real world, based on some world state, uh, will produce some, uh, some states and uh, eventually you want to follow this trajectory, which is given to you, right? So the controller objective that we have is that, let's say you have a specified trajectory shown in blue, Right. And what we want to optimize for is the total time taken for this trajectory and also the accuracy, which is, for example, the uh, the ex actual execution, which is shown in red. You want to penalize how far it uh, gets away from this trajectory because you might have, say, obstacles or things that you want to waypoints that you might want to hit and so on. Right. So what's the problem with this? The problem with this is that the forward kinodynamic function depends on unknown world states. And examples of unknown world states, for example, are things like you could be driving over mud or grass or grass with leaves. And these things really modify how these, uh, how the car really behaves in the real world. So what can you do about this? Well, there are some conventional uh, schools of thought of how you might address this. First of which is that, let's say you have some sensors on board and you have some observation function. This observation function might not be known to you. But in, in principle, you can take these observations and actually do some form of like terrain classification to understand what kind of terrain you're driving over. And if you have this terrain classification, you can use a terrain specific model to feed into your controller to solve this problem. So what we're going to do is actually slightly do something slightly different. We're going to learn an all terrain inverse kinodynamic function, and uh, we're going to do away with the necessity of requiring multiple models. And the key to doing that is essentially including in this inverse kinodynamic function, sensing observations, which are going to uh, feed into it. And what that's going to allow it to do is that it's going to discover the world speed, the world state dependence. And the internally what's happening is that this, uh, uh, this approximate model doesn't know the true world state W, but it has some observations Y and internally it needs to essentially build a, an observer to make these uh, unknown kinodynamic effects uh, uh, learnable, right? So, so how do we actually uh, learn this? What we do is that, uh, and you know, this is building on some ideas which have been uh, shared in previous talks today. We want to train from some off-track time. So what we do is that we have a human manually drive the uh, car around, not on a track, but just on the different types of terrain. And what we collect are joystick controls, the states of the car, the observations, and the actual outcome from the real world kinodynamics. We don't know what the function is, but we do see what, what actually happens. And then what we want to do is that we want to train a regression model with this as a supervised loss. And in particular, what the game that we're going to play is that the pretend that the actual outcomes were indeed what we are seeking. And then the regression model should say that, okay, so if that's what you wanted, the control that you should uh, output is actually what was uh, was provided to the joystick while executing this, right? So this is what's uh, going to uh, going to actually happen. Now, to actually implement this, we implemented on the, this on the UT Automata, which is our uh, our variation of the scale one tenth car. Uh, it's very similar to the pen model with a few modifications, uh, but in particular, the learning model that we have over here is a neural network architecture, which in particular feeds in the last uh, 100 states of an IMU sensor, including, for example, including over here, the accelerometer and the gyroscopes. And uh, they, all of this gets uh, downsampled into some embedding function, which is a two-dimensional vector. And that con is concatenated with a desired uh, state uh, or rate of change of the car is fed into another uh, second layer of this uh, feedforward model. 
And the output of that is going to be the total inverse Skinner dynamics. So we're learning jointly both an embedding function, which essentially is mapping how these observations are allowing the model to reason about what's different about this type of terrain and modify that in the actual inverse Skinner dynamic part later. Okay. So we actually implemented this and actually tried this out uh, on, an, an, on an actual track uh, with uh, multiple types of uh, off-road terrain uh, variations. And we actually compared three things. One is that we had a baseline model, which was no learned model essentially, which was a handwritten kinodynamic function. An ablation model was a learned model without sensing inputs. And what we want to show is that really the sensing inputs are very important to, uh, to actually learn terrain specific modifications of the kinodynamic function. And the green, which is ours, is a learned model with, uh, with sensing inputs. So we tried this at different speeds going from 1.6 meters per second all the way up to 2.5 meters per second. And we plot how many errors are there. So the larger these, uh, these circles, the more there are the number of uh, errors. And by and large, you can see that the no learned model, of course, has the most number of errors and the errors uh, uh, failures actually increase as you increase the speed. But also uh, the, what you see is that the ablation model uh, sees more errors than you would see from our full learned model with the sensing inputs. In terms of the actual failure turn, uh, 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 failure turn rate as, uh, as a function of speed, um, you find that uh, the baseline of course has a higher failure rate, highest failure rate. Uh, the learning based method which we uh, introduced has the lowest. It actually also outperforms the ablation model which, uh, which justifies the hypothesis that this sensing information is actually key to reasoning about these different types of terrains. And we also have evaluation of how this uh, is impacted for different types of uh, different turns. Now we also use this model and deploy this uh, to an easier terrain, but it's an, uh, uh, it's an unknown terrain, which is indoors. Um, and then we ran this in uh, essentially Shuesu's living room. And you have this, uh, you see the car driving around in laps. And again, uh, the same, uh, 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 essentially the ordering holds, which is that a learned model uh, is able to outperform uh, the, both the baseline as well as the ablation. Uh, and you see similar trends in terms of the overall failure rates. And uh, uh, I, just, I just want to share a video of this car actually executing this. We can see uh, scenarios where it's actually taking these turns and it's actually driving significantly laterally. And uh, these inverse kinodynamic function actually is able to account for that and uh, accordingly modify the steering functions of these of the car to be able to do that at high speed. So in conclusion, essentially what we did is that we showed that you can use these inertia-based observation embeddings to capture these elusive and stochastic world state impact uh, during off-road navigation on unstructured terrain. We showed that you can actually learn these inverse kinodynamic models for accurate and high-speed navigation in a data-driven manner. Um, and uh, you can actually see an improvement in the navigation performance in both the seen and unseen terrain and uh, with unknown track layouts, arbitrary track layouts. And in future work, what we want to do is expand uh, this, uh, these observation instruct just being IMU based. We want to also use vision and also we want to generalize from easy to harder environments. Okay. And with that, um, I will stop and we can take questions whenever the time is right. Thank you very much, Tony. And it's uh, very cool to see the F110 car or the 1 to 10 scale car <laughs> on an unstructured terrain and in such an environment. All right, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, now we're moving on to our second presentation from Brief Calaria. Um, and the presentation will be about local NMPC on global optimized path for autonomous racing. You can see the screen. Hello, everyone. Uh, am I audible? Uh, this... Yeah, we can hear you. Yep. Uh, switch on the video. All right, yeah, so we can't see the presentation yet. No, now we can see. Yeah, now we can. Yeah, all right. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, all right, so hello everyone. I'm here to present on our topic, which is local NMPC on global optimized path for uh, autonomous racing. So the basic motivation for our work is to develop a control algorithm that combines both motion planning and the low level controller uh, to give a unified algorithm that addresses objectives of not being uh, very conservative as it is for a race car, and at the same time, uh, avoiding collision with the vehicles and the use of drafting for uh, getting uh, more progress. 
Uh, however, for these work, we assume the availability of uh, accurate localized position of the vehicle uh, at each time step, and as well as the position of other vehicles uh, and obstacles within an admissible range for the LIDAR or radar sensor to detect. Right. So, uh, so the current approaches for motion planning uh, for these cars can be divided into three classes. One is the sampling-based approaches, uh, graph-based approaches, and numerical optimization-based approaches. So the sam uh, sampling-based approaches, uh, these type of methods, they sort of sample random points from the action space uh, to get to the target. Uh, most of these are a modification of the standard RRT star algorithm, uh, which finds an initial solution and iteratively improves uh, smoothness uh, and optimality of it with time. Uh, these methods, however, uh, mostly find the strengths in unstructured environments, as in uh, the racing scenario, uh, but however, uh, are not always guaranteed to uh, give good results uh, in a finite time. Uh, the graph-based approaches uh, include discretization of the uh, sample space, uh, uh, which is in this case the race track um, in longitudinal and lateral directions. Um, and at each uh, uh, at each sampling time uh, locally, uh, it considers these discrete sample points as nodes and uh, considers different parts over a, a finite horizon. Um, it eliminates uh, parts which pass through the obstacle and uh, for the winds which are uh, admissible or possible to traverse, uh, 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 they find the optimal one uh, uh, using uh, a heuristic function and follow it. Uh, the major challenge with these approaches is that they suffer from the cause of dimensionality uh, and to uh, like sample the track uh, with more number of steps, uh, it becomes computationally expensive. Right, and the third type of methods uh, which which we uh, which uh, we will be using is the optimization based methods, uh, which take a reference trajectory, which can either be from a high level planner or a global uh, planner, uh, and uh, and select an initial trajectory uh, and optimize it using uh, integral point optimization or dynamic programming based approaches like LQR. Uh, it basically contains of three, consists of three components. What is the dynamic model of the vehicle as uh, has been discussed. Uh, which like given the uh, current state and the control commands what the next state should be to determine that an objective function determines how good or better trajectory is and uh, and the constraints uh, which can be the hard constraints like the actuator uh, limits or soft constraints for additional safety. Uh, challenges faced by these methods include high computation time due to non-linearities in the model uh, and also uh, choosing a good objective function which uh, sort of maintains a balance between optimality and uh, computation time. All right, so uh, for our uh, work, we are using uh, a dynamic bicy bicycle model, uh, which is similar to previous works. Uh, the only difference being that uh, we use a full PSJKTAR model uh, with dynamic uh, coefficients to accurately model the tire forces uh, at high speeds. Uh, and by the dynamic model, I uh, uh, dynamic model, I mean that uh, as at high speeds, the normal forces are also change due to the uh, opposite lift force experienced by the vehicle. Uh, the, dynamic, uh, the coefficients uh, for the PSJK model also change, uh, and the variation of it is also included uh, uh, in the model. And the second uh, thing that we include, uh, and which was a part of the India Autonomous Challenge we participated in uh, is the drafting. Uh, the draft and by the drafting force, I mean that when a vehicle is behind a lead vehicle, uh, uh, it faces less aerodynamic uh, resistance force uh, due to the air stream which is blocked by the lead vehicle. Uh, so in order to express this, uh, uh, we multiply the aerodynamic force with a coefficient alpha, uh, which we uh, uh, which we uh, calculate linearly based, uh, uh, which we assume to be changing linearly based on uh, the long lateral and longitudinal distance from the uh, lead vehicle. Uh, right, so we were given this sort of a lookup table from the IAC team and we did out a linear model to uh, predict uh, the coefficient. So for our, for our, work, for, uh, our work, we first uh, calculate the global optimized path, um, which is the global racing line by solving the optimization problem to minimize the time to cover the full lap solo without considering any other vehicles and considering the vehicle dynamics. Uh, the, uh, the problem uh, can be considered equivalent to covering maximum distance in a uh, given time sufficient to complete the lab, uh, with the starting point as the uh, as the constraint uh, to the problem uh, we used here. And uh, uh, then for the overtaking uh, case, 
uh, we have uh, the overtaking strategy that we consider. Uh, as for overtaking, the problem is combinatorial in nature, uh, which means that in presence of multiple obstacles, we could uh, possibly go from left or right for each of the vehicle, uh, which leads to combinat uh, combinatorial problem. So in order to approximate the solution, um, what we do is that we take the previous project, the plan trajectory, uh, which is the purple line over here, and if it comes closer to any of the uh, obstacle, uh, any of the uh, target vehicle, uh, then for, then for that vehicle, uh, we consider one path from the left and one path from the right, uh, and we pass on both of them uh, uh, as the initial trajectory for optimization uh, to a uh, non-linear MPC, uh, and we choose the one which has the minimum cost. Uh, yeah. Uh, ignoring the other possible combinations as uh, we assume that they might not be uh, that much, uh, th they might not give good solutions. All right, so the objective function uh, th that we're using for, uh, use for optimization uh, basically consists of three parts. Uh, the objectives, one is to make uh, maximum progress on the uh, optimal racing line. The other is obstacle avoidance and the third is to take advantage of, uh, of drafting. So for making maximum progress on the uh, optimal racing line, uh, we consider a projection point, which is the uh, nearest perpendicular point on the uh, uh, optimal line. Uh, and we basically uh, consider the cost as the summation of the piecewise uh, distance uh, covered at each of the time step, uh, uh, which is the distance covered by the perpendicular point at uh, each of the time steps, uh, steps at the sample. Uh, and add it over uh, along the uh, horizon length to get the total uh, progress uh, made along the racing line. Uh, and for merging, uh, we multiply it with a term uh, which is proportional to the radius of curvature uh, at the current point uh, by uh, r plus d. Uh, so like by multiplying with that term, we ensure that the merging happens at the time of turns. Uh, of course, we empirically uh, obtain that uh, merging uh, when not at a turn and, and merging uh, during the turn. Uh, uh, when merging during the turn, uh, gives empirically uh, more progress. And also, it doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't interfere with the uh, obstacle avoidance uh, uh, term. And, yeah, and for the obstacle avoidance, uh, we include a cost term which is inversely proportional to the distance from the vehicle to penalize the vehicle for coming close uh, to any other vehicle, uh, and directly proportional to the relative uh, velocity uh, within the, from, uh, from that vehicle. Uh, yeah, and we also multiply it with an activation uh, function uh, so as to uh, differentiate the obstacle avoidance and the uh, uh, next cost on which I'll be talking about takes advantage of drafting. Uh, so uh, for that, we add uh, a cost term uh, uh, in, uh, which is proportional to the lateral distance uh, with respect to the uh, uh, frame of reference uh, of the target vehicle. Uh, so yeah, we add the cost term which is proportional to the uh, lateral distance. So minimum, so uh, it basically attracts the vehicle. Like so, vehicle behind the uh, uh, lead vehicle, uh, so as to uh, uh, get less aerodynamic force and thus make more progress. Uh, and multiplying with uh, you know, multiplying with uh, uh, activation function uh, uh, ensures a smooth transition between the drafting objective to the overtaking objective when it comes closer to the uh, lead vehicle. All right, so putting all together, uh, all the costumes together, uh, we get the final objective function, which is weighted mean of all the uh, individual terms. And we also add, uh, uh, add a cost term uh, to add a soft constraint uh, so that we ensure that the lateral slip angle is within the safe limit uh, for additional safety of the vehicle. All right, so solving the optimization problem, there are uh, multiple ways to do so. Uh, we are currently using the integral point optimization, uh, which is uh, sort of just by the structure of the objective function. And uh, uh, yeah, it, uh, it, uh, it is a derivative guided method. Uh, there are the methods which is sequential quadratic programming uh, and also dynamic programming based methods such as ILQR. And, uh, uh, and also, uh, uh, there are some works which convert the uh, system to a linear time variant system. Uh, based on the previous uh, trajectory, a previous plan trajectory. Uh, however, we are currently using IPOPT and uh, it is giving five FPS speed on VR exhibitor, which was given as part of the India Autonomous Challenge competition uh, with horizon length of 0.8 second uh, on Intel uh, Xeon CPU. Uh, 
uh, but however, we believe uh, the, that this uh, uh, this frame rate is uh, obviously less for real time deployment on the simulator. Uh, it's, it was a synchronous run, so it was possible to reduce the simulator time. Uh, but however, for real time deployment, we believe that uh, using iterative LQ for optimization should uh, boost up the uh, computation uh, time. So, and uh, as a future work, we are currently working on that. All right. So the final algorithm. Uh, uh, is that uh, we take the previous n minus one plant steps and check that if it collides with uh, if it comes in uh, to any of the, any of the vehicle, uh, then for that vehicle uh, we take one path uh, from uh, from the left and from the right as, as the uh, overtaking strategy that we discussed, uh, and we optimize both of them individually uh, using an MPC. and we take the first uh, uh, first plant step uh, yeah. on MPC. Yeah. Sorry for interrupting you. We are over time here. Could you please oh, so, come sorry, to an end? Yes, okay. so we are, we are much over time was, here. Yep, 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 yep. Okay, good. Yeah, so it was just a uh, practice on video, uh, which okay. is also on the paper. So see that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we are a little bit over time. Um, we are directly moving on to the next presentation. Thank you very much. Um, the next presenter is Jay and Bargav. Um, he worked together with me and Robin Mangaram, and he's presenting our work. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Um, I will be presenting uh, our work titled uh, Track-Based Offline Policy Learning for Overtaking Maneuvers with Autonomous Race Cars. Yeah, um, so overtaking is a challenging problem and uh, it's majorly because vehicles have to detect and operate at the limits of dynamic handling it's not an urban scenario where you, you are at low speeds and you need to do a safe overtake. You're usually aggressive and you're, you, you will be racing against an opponent. So we, we, we wanted to come up with techniques for successful overtaking maneuvers. And our work has two broad contributions. One is a design of experiments um, where we come up with ways in which we generate racing scenarios from which we can learn. And then uh, an offline policy learning approach from these experiments uh, uh, for learning uh, uh, overtaking strategies. And then we implement this uh, into the Ego vehicle in a switched MPCC controller architecture, which we propose uh, at the end of the paper. So, Coming to the design of experiments, we have chosen the Silverstone track, um, um, a scaled version of the Silverstone track to design our experiments. And all our simulations are based on this uh, Silverstone track. As a first step, what we do is we discretize the Silverstone track into multiple uh, track portions. Uh, we can observe on the screen that the track portions are marked from one, two, three, up to eight. And these are basically the different turns uh, present in the Silverstone track. So they have different names, uh, like uh, the straightway, the sweeper curves, hairpin, chicane, and like they're labeled um, uh, in the figure as you can see on the screen. So what are we trying to achieve is by given a track, we discretize the track into multiple track portions, and we're trying to learn specific policies for each track portion, uh, and you know how better to overtake at each of these track portions. So uh, like, how are we conducting our experiments is we have two vehicles. One is the ego, the one in the blue, and the one is the opponent vehicle or the obstacle vehicle, which is in the red. So all our experiments are based on uh, these two vehicles where the opponent or the red vehicle is following a pre-computed optimal race line of the Silverstone track. And the ego vehicle starts behind it. Uh, the goal of each experiment is to check if there is an overtake or not. And we give a lot of different uh, starting positions for the ego vehicle to start from. So uh, as you can see that there's a mesh grid of all the possible starting points uh, in blue, lateral and longitudinal variations. And we also vary the speed of the opponent, like we give uh, a 20% increase or 20% decrease in the speed just to provide drift. So with so many variations in positions and velocities, we roll out both the agents at each track portion. And we, we, we log all the data and we check if 
uh, for the number of overtakes in each track portion. And uh, how is the ego vehicle uh, rolling out on the track is uh, we use the model predictive contouring control, the, the paper on 143rd, uh, you know, scaled autonomous racing by Alex. We have used the modified version of that, uh, where we have a uh, uh, MPCC problem being solved for the ego vehicle. Uh, the, the two main things are the contouring and the lag errors. And we penalize the contouring and lag errors. Um, and, and this optimizes the path planning of the ego vehicle on the track. Uh, we include the track constraints um, and the obstacle constraints um, as h of x x phi. As we can see, they, they are the nonlinear constraints being in, uh, you know integrated into the MPCC. So the ego vehicle plans its path in using this algorithm and uh, tries to overtake the obstacle while the obstacle is following a pre-computed race line. So um, uh, this is like the overview of our algorithm. Uh, as you can observe in the figure, um, we divide the track portions into four, uh, like four different regions, the front left, front right, back left and back right. And uh, we sample equal points in all the four regions, um, R1, R2, R3 and R4. And um, the position of the uh, ego vehicle is uh, varied in all the four regions with these sample points. And we roll out both of them. Uh, and this happens at every track portion. We have eight track portions and we conduct this experiment at every track portion. So what happens with this is we generate a lot of experimental data. And uh, I present a simple uh, you know, case of a hairpin curve. If you look at figure A, it's a hairpin curve. And um, we, we, we perform these experiments at the hairpin and we have an overtaking window marked by the yellow lines. So at the end of the hairpin, if the blue car overtakes the red car, we know that it was a successful overtake at the hairpin. So um, this is how we count the number of overtakes and we populate the probability distribution for all the four regions. From this, we get the region of highest probability of overtaking. And that's where we, we are trying to learn that having this position advantage is going to help us overtake at this curve. So uh, if we look at the distribution of the overtakes across different opponent speeds, we can observe that when the opponent is slower, um, of course, we have a lot of overtakes no matter where we start on the track. The graph on the right, the first one shows that. But when the opponent is at the baseline speed, we observe that there are there is a concentration of overtakes on the front left, but not many on the back side and not many on the front right. So like what, what we conclude is that staying on the front left when you enter the hairpin is going to give you a higher advantage to overtake the opponent. So this is what we call as the policy learning. So um, the policy is purely based on the position at which you start. So you're trying to learn the position advantage you should be at for a successful overtaking maneuver at a given uh, you know, track portion in, in the Silverstone track. So what we did is we have like eight track portions, um, like multiple sweepers, hairpins, chicanes, and straights in the whole Silverstone track. And we find the overtaking probabilities at all the track regions, at all track portions of the whole Silverstone track. And we use this to generate the policies which the ego vehicle will then use to race in this track. This is as though the ego vehicle is given a lot of you know, practice on the Silverstone track before it actually enters the race. the race. So it's an offline learning approach. So we do all offline experiments and then we test it online. So what we do to test it online is we have a switched MPCC controller where the MPCC has multiple modes to switch between and each mode is uh, specific to a particular driving behavior. So we, we have a mode which says drive on the right side of the track. So if you're at the chicane and you have to stay on the inside portion of the track, which is the right side, then we have a mode of the MPC which forces the vehicle to move only on that portion of the track. And then there is another mode called move left. And then there is another mode called move normally in the whole track. So this switch mode MPCC has integrated the policies which we want 
we can have multiple policies integrated into the MPCC controller, but here we have only three of them integrated. So with this, uh, you have learned the offline policies. We integrate them into the MPCC planner, and then we conduct an ex the same experiments at all track portions. So the table here clearly depicts that um, with the policy on, uh, the number of overtakes is evidently higher, especially in the turns which are convoluted like the hairpin and the chicane. Uh, it doesn't really matter in the straight because uh, overtaking in the straight is very easy. So that's, the, that's evidently the outcome of this. So we uh, this is like a short GIF where you can see the car at the same turn is uh, moving either always on the left or always on the right. This is the policy, the switched MPCC uh, coming into action with whatever policy we ask it to drive with. So um, with this, uh, we uh, what we concluded basically was given a given given a big track, we can we were able to discretize it into multiple track portions. And at each track portion with exhaustive experiments, we were able to find those regions where if my vehicle starts at that region, it's, it has a positional advantage for it to execute a successful overtaking maneuver. And uh, in some portions, we, we saw nearly three times the number of overtakes. And uh, in like, you know, uh, in a straight, it doesn't make a big difference because it's always easy to overtake in the straight. But in very convoluted turns like the hairpin or the chicane, this uh, policy, offline policy learning, sh has showed a considerable increase in the number of overtakes. So yeah, that is what is being summarized here again. Um, so I don't think I need to reiterate through this. Um, this was just like a very basic work. Um, what we are trying to do is extend this into many more cases to study and a few of them to name would be having opponents which are react, which are non-reactive, but which are blocking. What if we have an opponent? Can we learn a policy to overtake it effectively? Uh, will we be successful in you know learning policies and implementing them? Is that sufficient? And then what happens if the opponent becomes reactive? Like now we have the ego planning the uh, path with MPCC, but the opponent is just you know following a pre-computed race line. What if the opponent got smarter? What if it also plants it pa its path with MPCC? So that's another experiment which is in line and we're working on it now. Uh, we will have like two MPCC of, uh, you know, racing uh, with each other and uh, we can integrate uh, like and the constraints and make the game more and more uh, exciting and see how well the policy learning algorithm will, you know, scale to all these scenarios. Uh, we have like move, we can also extend it to game theoretic approaches, but that very ahead of our plan. And another thing which we are also, you know, uh, in line is to evaluate it over different, you know, uh, track curvatures. Yeah. So this was about our work we can take the q a during the q a session thank you all right uh, thank you very much um now we are moving on to our fourth presentation from shakti vadikar and again we have a machine learning deep learning approach it's called towards end-to-end -to -end deep learning for autonomous racing on data collection and a unified architecture for steering and throttle prediction mm -hmm. So am I audible and is my screen visible to all? Yeah, we can hear you and can see the screen. Okay. Yeah, so I'm Shakti Varekar. I'm presenting our work, uh, which is towards end-to-end -end deep learning for autonomous racing on data collection and unified architecture for steering and throttle prediction. Um, so what I will be going through is, uh, I'll be explaining our data-centric approach, why we are taking it, and uh, what are the data collection strategies that we learn by taking this approach? And uh, uh, from the data collection strategies, we collect data and we learn uh, using a fixed model, neural network model, and show the insights that we get uh, with that. And finally, we show a unified architecture which simplifies the throttle learning along with uh, steering learning. 
uh, and uh, I'll show the architecture and how it is trained. So first is uh, what's our data centric approach is for, for solving any problem using deep neural networks, we have two main components of data and deep neural network architecture. So uh, our data centric approach is fixing uh, the deep neural network architecture and uh, tuning and experimenting with the data itself. Uh, for example, we can vary the data collection process uh, depending on how, what task we want to do on the track and also uh, designing training strategies by using uh, subsamples of uh, our data sets to again uh, achieve a specific goal on the track. So why do we need data centric approach here? So applying end-to-end -end learning to this problem uh, is, is picking up and there's no standard data set for this. So we need uh, uh, a global data set or a, a high level data set uh, and we need strategies on how to collect them, what are the effective ways, uh, you know, in what, what ways we should collect them, which will be effective for the neural network models. And uh, for the neural network architectures, we can borrow them from the similar problems, which is urban driving. Uh, we cannot borrow the uh, data sets from them because they have a very different setting, they have very different environments, and they are at low speeds. So uh, a focus on data is needed at this early stage of development. So the experimental setup, what we do is we have built a custom simulator. We have uh, ported the self-driving, Udacity self-driving car sim in Unity platform, and we are able to uh, change its, uh, the max speed to 150 miles per hour. And we, are, uh, we also have now ability to build tracks in it so that uh, we make custom builds track. Uh, uh, track one is IMS track that we custom build. And second is again, uh, a sharp turned uh, track where we wanted to validate all our observations on a difficult track. Uh, so that our uh, observations are track agnostic. Uh, so during training mode, it captures data at 10 Hertz. This number is important later, which will uh, talk about the data efficiency. Uh, then we collect, what is the uh, tra training uh, data that we collect is images from three camera, and then uh, steering values, throttle values, and speed data. All, is this, all of this is recorded at 10 Hertz during training mode. So what is the deep neural network architecture and training methodology that we use uh, is uh, we use the architecture which is similar to NVIDIA's end-to-end -end learning architecture. And uh, these are the exact uh, uh, details. The diagram shows the exact details of our uh, architecture. This is used, uh, input is image, output is the steering value or direct steering value. So the training methodology we use is, uh, we call this as a direct policy learning. And it's a combination of behavioral cloning and data aggregation. Behavioral cloning is supervised learning with labels provided by the experts. For example, a human uh, is driving, uh, the input is image and the output is the steering values and throttle uh, that uh, uh, the expert inputs. And data aggregation is uh, having an expert in the loop and improving the data, improving the data collection process. So we collect the training data, we train it, we uh, test it on the track. Then we see the performance, see if, if there's an undesired driving behavior uh, and uh, ask the uh, expert whether we have to change the data or modify the data or collect more training data to perform better. So that's the training loop. Um, then what are the what we learn from these uh, uh, from uh, from the data collection strategies is if we only collect data on the optimal path on the track it doesn't lead to stable driving if we deviate by a, even if by a very small amount from the optimal path it crashes so it needs to learn more so what we did was we did we broke down the problem into two parts first is to learn to drive at high speeds and then to learn uh, optimal uh, driving on optimal path after learning to drive fast so, uh, so our work addresses the first part, how to learn uh, driving at high speeds. So uh, what we observe is along with the amount of data, the diversity on, uh, in the data is key. And what are the specific elements is driving on both lanes, both lanes you can see as driving on both sides of the track, then uh, changing lanes between at, at different points of the track when we are driving at high speeds and driving closer to the edges and coming back to the center. This is especially needed for the sharp turns. But this, the, these are important because when we drive at high speeds and deviate from the optimal path, it, it should know how to come back to the optimal path. So it has to see these scenarios and uh, uh, to come back and follow the optimal path. So uh, once we collect this data with the strategy, uh, what do we learn by using this model? So we use the uh, NVIDIA's architecture, which predicts steering. So all this data is related to uh, steering prediction. 
So as, as we see, the first insight is it uh, on the first track, we do it for 80 miles per hour. And second, if we do it for 60 miles per hour, we, we limit this for at this speed, because if we go beyond this, the steering value is now dependent on the throttle value. So we wanted that uh, steering value to be independent and to go for beyond, uh, beyond these speeds, we need to so solve the problem of predicting steering and throttle together, which, uh, which uh, our second uh, part of the work addresses. So we are at 80 miles and 60 miles of track one and track two. So if we see this trend, uh, the x-axis is number of laps, which is amount of data, and uh, y-axis is uh, speeds uh, per mile, uh, speeds in miles per hour, which is achieved. So as we increase the data, it is able to achieve higher and higher speeds. But uh, as we uh, as we see, even though if it's not able to achieve higher speeds, it is able to uh, achieve good performance driving, like reduce oscillations and uh, it's not touching the edges uh, and, and uh, it establishes that direct relation. The second insight we have is uh, it can learn higher speeds or with less data at uh, using the high speed driving data. So if you see at 15 laps here, uh, you can see a 15 laps collected at 30 miles per hour, it is able to drive at 30 miles per hour, but uh, same uh, we are able to achieve uh, 40 and 50 miles per hour high speed uh, uh, with the high speed data. And if you see the difference, we collect the data at 10 Hertz. So the data 15, collect, uh, 15 laps collected at 30 miles per hour is uh, much higher than 40 and uh, uh, at 50 and 80 miles per hour. So we are achieving a data efficiency and uh, you know, with less data, we can achieve the highest speeds. Of course, these are initial observations. This has to be validated for higher speeds and uh, you know, we, we are trying to do that. And, sec uh, and the second part addresses how do we achieve higher speeds. So now uh, we, we want to go beyond this speeds. So now how do we train a model to learn steering and throttle together? So first we again train the, uh, train the model similar as we explained earlier. Now to learn throttle predictions, what we do, what we show is we can use the same convolutional layers which are in the steering model and use in throttle model without retraining them in the throttle model. We, we only train the fully connected layers uh, and achieve the throttle uh, uh, predictions. It is without, yeah, it, it, it is without the LSTM and recurrence in the network, which, which can help it to get faster uh, and achieve higher performance at this high, uh, high speed driving. So our, uh, during inference, this is how our uh, inference model looks like because it has the shared convolutional uh, layers. It is, uh, we, can, we can share this layers and it is kind of a multi, uh, multi-task network. This can also be utilized in future uh, for bounding loss predictions, object tracking and all those things. And we have uh, YouTube links which uh, demonstrate uh, the inference model working. And uh, we have a track to model which shows at 90 miles per hour. This is again uh, initial work. We are trying to get this uh, up to speed for uh, high speed racing and at higher speeds. Oh, okay. So if we see it starts at these speeds, it's able to achieve, um, reach 90 miles per hour. So at, at turn, you should be able to see that it is able to reduce control throttle and reduce speed. And then later on other parts of the track, it is also for next turns. I think it is, this is a fairly sharp turn. It is able again to reduce the speed to 70. And we have put a lot of obstacles or uh, you know, different variations to have shadows in the uh, track. And it's able to reduce the speed and control the car. Yeah, that's uh, that's it from my side. Um, that's that was our work, and uh, yeah, you're welcome for questions whenever the time is suitable. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think your competitors are are there that have different approaches uh, in machine learning based uh, learning for steering and uh, throttle. So interesting research, and we will see how it works out in comparison. Thanks for your presentation. Um, we will move on to our next talk uh, from my former university, Tim Brüdigam from TUM. Uh, happy to have you here. You can start your presentation.
All right, thanks for the introduction, Johannes. Um, here the focus isn't really on tire forces or friction, but we focus on another aspect that humans handle exceptionally well, which is overtaking and specifically predicting the interaction that's gonna happen while overtaking happens. Um, we usually don't really focus on racing, but more on road vehicles, but we've recently tried to extend our methods to racing. So happy to present more preliminary results on tackling this problem um, with a Gaussian process-based stochastic MPC. So Alexander Capone took care of more of the uh, GP um, part and I myself um, was more on the stochastic MPC part and we had support from the Quolher, Marvin Leibold and Sandra Hirche. Let me quickly start with um, the following. So if you look at uh, Robo Race, for example, overtaking happened, but it wasn't active overtaking, it was more passive overtaking where you had to be too clo or close enough in a trigger zone, um, which would then make the other car let you overtake. So you can see here, the car that is trailing is close enough. Uh, you can already see the disappointed faces of the team that is going to be overtaken. Um, and then the car just has to let the, the trailing car pass. But of course, this is not really what we love about racing. What we love about racing is the active um, overtaking, the close tire to tire interaction. And this is what, what we want to focus here, like active or autonomous overtaking. Um, let me quickly look at uh, road vehicles here. This is an example of Waymo driving. You can see it's on the right lane, wants to merge into the lane to the left, but there are too many vehicles um, on the left side. So a human driver would probably be able to get in, but um, for, the, for the autonomous vehicle that is driving more conservatively, this is quite difficult. And, whoops. Um, and I, I recently found a, um, a cool quote that was um, summarizing this in the New York Times saying, self-driving uh, self tech can usually handle suburban Phoenix, but it can't duplicate the human chutzpah needed for emerging into the Lincoln Tunnel in New York or dashing for an off-ramp on Highway 101 in Los Angeles. So I'm right now in California, so you see this quite often, where you have cars just uh, making into narrow spaces and getting in. It's quite annoying for some cars, but it's, it's amazing how, how humans do this without hardly ever actually crashing. All right, um, this leads me to the, to the challenges and goals and uh, most obviously the vision that we have. Um, what we want to do here is the following. We want to, to first of all, um, consider the, the uncertainty that is part of, of racing um, and reduce the conservative, conservatism. And this includes the following. We first of all want to identify best opportunities to overtake on a, on a racetrack. So you can see here the Hungaroring where we can overtake on, on the straight or turn one and two, and then there's another overtaking opportunity in six and seven that is quite popular. Um, and what we want to do here is we want to find out over multiple laps, you know, sometimes you're, you're stuck behind a vehicle for multiple laps, where are weak spots? Where are uh, typical spots where cars in front of us make mistakes that we can exploit? And um, this we do with a, a GP, with a Gaussian process. And then given the, the predictions from the Gaussian process, um, we plan optimistic overtaking maneuver, maneuvers with stochastic MPC. So this, um, this is the, the big vision. I already have to say, uh, we're not quite there yet, but we're working on it. Um, yeah, let, let me quickly start with the GP, which is gonna be the first part. So um, we want to model um, a, a process and we have a known part and an unknown part. And the GP basically, models this unknown part for, for the um, next state prediction, um, which is based on data that we collect. So we just uh, collect data from, from, the, from our ego vehicle and the vehicles around us, which we call target vehicles. And, and uh, given these uh, data, we can, we can model a mean prediction of, of what we happen, uh, what we predict to happen for the target vehicles in the future, depending also on our motion. Um, and this happens by sampling. And of course, it would be uh, too simple to just look at the mean trajectory. We also need to look at the covariance. And, and this gives us an uncertainty measure that we can then use in the stochastic MPC part. If you wanna find out more, uh, check out Alex's ACC paper from last year, super interesting stuff there. Um, for, the, for the SMPC, let me quickly go through the, through the steps here. So we start with the initial states. Um, and then given the GP, we, we predict what we think is gonna to happen to the target vehicle given our current states. Um, and of course, we also have uncertainty here. And given this uncertainty, we, we use uh, SMPC to compute the uh, optimal trajectory for the next few steps. 
Um, this is based on a chance constraint in SNPC, so um, we don't have to fulfill our constraints all the time, but for example, just in 99% of the cases. What then happens is in MPC, we only apply the very first optimized step and then replan again. So we, we um, get to the next position. And remember, um, initially we thought we could overtake on the left, but now since we started to go to the left, the target vehicle is actually also moving to the um, left in order to block us from moving. So, so we, um, have, uh, we take advantage of the SNPC structure that we can replan and kind of get feedback into a loop. And, and the next step, we, we have the opportunity to change our strategy and, for example, overtake on the right side here. Let me quickly talk about constraints here where we're stealing from, from the work that we've done in, in road vehicles and um, design linear constraints here. And um, just, just very simple. So this, this gives us a, a quadratic program with linear constraints, easy to solve. We're currently working on um, using ellipsoidal constraints because this reduces conservatism quite, quite a bit, but um, it's not quite, quite ready yet. But we're very excited about this because this is going to be great for racing. So what does the, the MPC optimal control problem look like? We have a cost function where we try to follow a path here. We've heard before, uh, maybe following paths is not ideal, but let's Let's not focus on this here now. We have a prediction model um, and we have constraints, for example, acceleration constraints, road boundaries. And then um, I, I quickly uh, briefly showed the safety constraints before the linear ones. Uh, we just have these linear constraints that um, help us to overtake without colliding. And this is basically all that the optimal control program consists of at the moment, uh, not very complex. Um, yeah, so just a simple simulation example, nothing, nothing fancy here. We have a straight road uh, kinematic bicycle model for our ego vehicle. Um, we we um, predict with a point mass model for a target vehicle. The target vehicle actually um, performs uh, very simple maneuvers based on a simple algorithm trying to block us. Um, what we have to mention here, we use the, the one move rule. So the target vehicle is only allowed to block us once and can't just oscillate back and forth all the time, which is actually quite uh, challenging for some um, methods to learn because it, there's like a um, discrete change happening here. And what does this look like? So the ego vehicle plans to overtake on the left at first. Um, you can see the, the, the confidence interval by the target vehicle. Um, we're learning um, the, the behavior of it. And, and I stopped here because at this point, um, the target vehicle continues to the left to block us. And we actually learned this. We, we can see that the, the red prediction is going to the left. So um, MPC now gives us the chance to, to change our trajectory and plan trajectory to the right and basically overtake the, um, the vehicle, the red vehicle on the, on the right side. And given the, the one move rule, um, it's not allowed to go back. Um, so we, we uh, made this overtaking with interaction happen here. Let me quickly talk about some observations. So uh, GP proved to be very powerful to um, approximate these complex interactions. And um, right now we're, we're updating the GP at every step, which is probably not necessary um, because the GP can be quite time extensive, but um, we, we could just do it every, every uh, few seconds um, because we don't uh, need to, we, we, we're just overtaking at certain uh, turns, for example. SMPC is, is great for planning optimistically. However, there is a non-zero collision probability. Um, we've worked on this for road vehicles um, and we, we think it could also be extended to racing um, where we proposed a safe stochastic MPC framework, which, which had a backup. Um, could be interesting, we're working on this right now, but of course there are also other things. Um, right now, very simple simulation example, we want to extend it to a full racetrack and multiple race cars, and, and focus more on learning these weak spots for other vehicles in overtaking relevant uh, parts of the track. And then of course, tire road interaction, I've heard a lot about it, um, uh, would be great to incorporate and um, using the ellipsoidal constraints. Um, perfect, thanks. If you have any questions, let us know in the chat or, or contact us afterwards. We're, we're happy to discuss our work. Thanks a lot. Yeah, well, thank you very much for the presentation. And I found it really interesting that you came directly from the road application, said, hey, let's do this in racing and then forth and back. Uh, something where we have not seen a lot today. So very great talk. Um, we're moving on to the next presentation um it's tony tony bang uh telling yeah. us something today about the deep copeman data-driven control framework for autonomous racing tony uh hold on um 
Let me share my screen first. Mm -hmm. No worries. All right. and, uh, yeah, we can see it. Okay, so let me get started. Uh, yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, um, uh, my name is Rong Yao, and my English name is Tony. And uh, I'm currently uh, a graduate researcher at uh, Clemson University in the mechanical engineering departments. And the topic today we'll be discussing is the decoupment data driven optimal control framework for autonomous racing. Uh, so the contents for this presentation will be uh, including the first we'll give you the introductions of our research and some theoretical preliminaries that needed to understand it. And, and then we'll be discussing the, uh, the, ex the two experiments, both in simulations as well as the onboard vehicles. And that will be uh, the discussion uh, with the conclusions about the future works. And for, for this research, uh, the major the main top the main goals is to learn the vehicle dynamics and the racing speeds using Krugman operator theories. In that cases, um, we will learn a little bit using part of the controls from the expert drivers, and this accelerator can be and can be professional drivers or someone else. And also, uh, we're using the the Krugman operator theories to learn the vehicle dynamics um, based on the the expert uh, driver inputs. And then uh, we tested this approach uh, in the simulation environment with the F110 simulators. And also uh, once we tested and valid our approach in the simulations, we also test on the real onboard vehicles as well. Um, so first uh, let's break down to some basics uh, about this uh, Krugman operator theories. So the main ideas, the main goals of uh, incorporating Krugman operator theories in this approach is to transform uh, the long linear dynamics in the state space and transform into a linear dynamics in the space of observable functions and through a certain in the states of observables through a lifting functions also called as uh, observable function as you can see here so after lifted states the state space will do the finite finite approximations uh, on the observable state space and to find uh, uh, a linear states up uh, linear state space updates and uh, if you want to know more about these topics, I have a uh, paper links uh, uh, below here. So if you want to take a look at this later, and there will be a lot of abundant information about this. And uh, for our particular research, we're using a deep neural networks or neural networks um, as the Kuhlman operators, which is observable functions in these cases, as you can see in these diagrams. So we have the inputs, and then we put the inputs into uh, the, the, the initialized uh, Deep neural networks, and then we have the predictors and uh, ZT, which is the the observables uh, on the observable functions, and then we uh, find out the loss based on this um, loss functions, and we update the neural networks. And once we convert to very low values, we can approximate uh, uh, the the state space updates functions in the lifted dynamics, and then we'll be using uh, the model predictive controls uh, approach to control the vehicles on the lifted uh, observable space. And also there's another uh, papers on, on, on this on the bottom of these pages and also have some details uh, about this approach. So, so one of the advantages of using a new neural networks as Kuhlman operators that you can actually find out uh, a very low dimensions and then you can gradually uh, uh, improve uh, the accuracy of the lifted state space. And rather than the, uh, the other way around and as we taught before in this uh, presentations, when you choose a predefined uh, observable functions, you will probably end up have a very high lifted dimensions on our volumes of space, which can compromise the efficiency of solving MPC. So first we um, valid our result in the F110 simulations. And uh, from our experiments, we can see the DKRC actually uh, have a better uh, tracking performances, um, which we'll give you the statistic later in the next pages. And we also tested uh, in the obstacle avoidance to see if it's going to be able to deal with the sharp turns and these things this controller going to be stable and the result is pretty satisfactory and um, based on our experiments um, um, as you can see on the left charts and the, the the blue bars is the mean values and the black bars the range of the errors from all the way to the minimum to the highest so as you can see our data driven uh, models uh, can have the better performances compared to the nonlinear pc based on the kinematics bicycle models and as well as the pure pursuit controllers. And the, for this, uh, for the reference trajectory we use uh, to track for the vehicles inside this close to tracks, um, we, we use the, uh, the, the so solving a local minimum, uh, local planning problems uh, iteratively through the single tracks 
uh, with uh, the weights of uh, with object functions of minimum times as well as minimum curvatures. And we use around like 60, 65% of minimum distance and 20% of minimum distance uh, as our weight as our weighting functions when we try to uh, to solve this uh, local optimal problems. And uh, so th this is the diagrams we show how do we generate uh, this racing line. Um, as we as we mentioned before, that to solve a local planning problems iteratively through the tracks. And then we once we get the have, obtain the global trajectories, we use the dynamic programming to all to obtain the optimal velocity profile. And then we use the 60% on minimum curvatures when we generate the global trajectories. And um, so from our experiments after that, we can the, the global trajectory include the harsh brakes and harsh accelerations as well as steerings so that we can test our control performance um, better at racing speed. And uh, so I also deployed, uh, we also deployed the same, uh, the similar approach in the real testings. And this is the maps we build from the Clemson Mechanical Engineering Department's yeah, the basements of it. And then we use the same approach to, uh, to generate a global trajectories for testing. And then we te use the same approach to, uh, to use the deep movement approach to generate the vehicle models and apply the model to the controls. Um, and the results is also pretty stable and fast. And, to, and it turns out this is uh, it's a pretty good result. So for research conclusions, uh, we'll be able to learn the vehicle dynamics uh, without the full knowledge of the vehicle parameters because the vehicle dynamics are actually learning um, through the through the Kuhlmann, Kuhlmann operator theories. And then the, the results suggest that we have the, a pretty good tracking performance uh, compared to the other popular vehicle controllers. And our control is both stable uh, and uh, safe, uh, in, uh, even at the racing speeds. So that's all for our presentations. And uh, thank you so much for attention. I'm looking forward to your questions in the Q&A sections. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Um, cool to seeing that you're using the F110's car. And you are now the third person talking about Koopman. And that's for me uh, the time to get more in, into the field, because I have to admit, I don't know much about it. And now after this day, I think I have to uh read a little bit more about it so thank you very much for your presentation okay and thank you now yeah you're welcome and now we are moving on to the last presentation um it's from christina milner and it's about the continuous integration testing for autonomous racing software and experience report from greik and it was another autonomous racing competition um two weeks ago and she will tell us a little bit more about it hello you can hear me and see my screen? Yeah. Great. Uh, yeah, so hello, my name is Christina Miller, and today I'm going to be talking about the Generalized Racing Intelligence Competition, or GRACE. And so this is a work that was done with a group of people from both the University of Illinois, as well as the University of Michigan. And we held our first GRACE competition um, at CPS Week 2021. So as previously mentioned, the new frontier of racing is an autonomy. Um, so we have the, comp, uh, the race to get the first commercially available autonomous taxis, as well as several different research races, such as the F110 competition, Alpha Pilot, and the AI robotic racing. So why do we need yet another race uh, in this field? So here we're inspired by the transformative power of software benchmarks. For example, we have ImageNet here, which was very influential in developing image classification algorithms. And so in order for us to have an ImageNet moment for autonomy, we first need to have an ImageNet for autonomy. So when creating GRACE, we had several different design objectives and challenges. First, we wanted this to be a generalized racing intelligence competition, which means we want the competitors to be able to control many different types of vehicles in many different types of scenarios, and even with different types of simulators. We also want this competition to be post-perception, which means we focus on the decision and control algorithms for autonomy and not necessarily the perception part of autonomy. We also want this competition to be open and flexible, which means we want our competition infrastructure and our submissions to be publicly available for research. And maybe these submissions can even be used in verification. And we also want our competitors to be able to create their own scenarios so they can benchmark their own decision and control algorithms later in research. However, we know that there's a lot of different challenges with comparing different tools. For example, these tools can use different interfaces. They can also use different platforms 
and there can also be many different simulators that are used. And some challenges that are specific to autonomy benchmarks can be overlearning. So we don't want our controllers to only work for one type of vehicle in one type of scenario. We also know that the interfaces for autonomy can be very complex and that these systems are reactive and that the simulators can introduce some sort of non-determinism in our evaluation. So what we did is we built the GRACE framework and this is just a preview of what a car that's tracing in GRACE might look like. We will provide the milestone waypoints that the competitor as much as fast as possible. And then as the cars are driving along in the competition, they will encounter other scenarios that they must be able to deal with. So this is a chart of what our architecture looks like. Right now we're using the Carla simulator. However, we can swap this out for any simulator that we want to use. We also use ROS Noetic and Python 3. And the main things to note here are the perception oracle, where we provide the perception data to our competitors, the controller, which is submitted by our competitors, and then the vehicle model, which is provided by whichever simulator we decide to use. So for our sensing and perception, we decided to use a perception oracle, which provides the ground truth data of the environment that's around the vehicle. And so we decided to do this because we wanted our competition to be uh, post-perception and not necessarily focus on the perception part of autonomy. Next, we look at our actuation interface. Um, so we provided two different types of models for our competitors to use. The first is an explicit vehicle model, which has some mathematical dynamics that that vehicle will follow. And then we also have a black box vehicle model, which is provided by the simulator. And so here for this black box, the physics can be very complicated and we don't necessarily know the entire dynamics up front. So both of these vehicle models use the same type of controller commands, which is just the steering and the throttle commands that the competitors must generate using their controllers. So with these interfaces, there's a wide variety of controllers that we can use in the GRACE competition. So we can use a human driver, which one of our team members actually did that to compare against the competitor's submissions. We also have a very basic controller that we provided with our framework for the competitors to compare against. And then there's several different motion planning algorithms that the competitors can use. They can also use a variety of tracking controllers and they can use other controller synthesis methods or even train controllers, as long as these controllers provide the inputs that are required by our vehicles. So the biggest thing with GRACE is that we actually were able to build uh, an automated testing pipeline. So our design goals for this testing pipeline were that the pipeline should be automated. So it has very little human interaction when we're uh, scoring the controllers that were submitted by our competitors. We also wanted the results to be deterministic to make it fair across the board for all of our competitors. And that when we had a controller that was benchmarked on a certain scenario, we would get the same result for that scenario every time. We also wanted to run these races concurrently. So we wanted to have multiple containers running races at the same time so we could get as many results from those competitors as possible. And then we also wanted these containers to be isolated so a race that's running in one container wouldn't affect the results of a race that's being run in a different container. And so our solution was to have the participants uh, submit all of their code with the dependencies, which we would then install in our build server. And then we would compile their controller code and build it and execute it. And once we get all of the results and metrics from the, from the race, then we would email that out to our competitors. So here's a chart of what the testing pipeline looks like. So first, the competitors would submit their code to us, which we would then upload to a cloud-based storage system. And here we just use AWS. And once that controller code was submitted, we would then notify our build server to start running the races and to get all the results and metrics from each race. And so here we have our Jenkins CI pipeline, where each container contains a Carla, um, and ROS, as well as our GRACE framework and the controller that the competitor submitted. And then once we loaded the controller into there, we would run the race, we would uh, start the race, and then we would collect all of the results from that race. And once we got the results from the race, then we would email the results and the videos to our competitors. 
So one of the biggest challenges in this evaluation was determinism. So here we consider a race to be deterministic if for the same track vehicle and racing configuration, and given the deterministic controller that our competitors submitted, then the results should be identical. And here we just scored the vehicles based off of the time it takes for the vehicle to complete the race, plus some collision penalty and some lane departure penalty. And so this just means that the lower that the score is, the better that the vehicle performed. And if a vehicle did not finish the race, then we would give a score of did not finish. So here we have many different sources of non-determinism. The first is that Carla's original spawning strategy for our scenarios was completely randomized. Um, also the initialization of all of the different threads that we had, such as the perception threads and the controller threads can lead to some non-determinism in the race. And we also know that Ross message delays can also lead to non-determinism. Um, and then we also know that whenever the vehicle collides with another vehicle in the track, then this collision can cause some more non-determinism. So in order to get more non-deterministic races or more deterministic races, we went ahead and we did several different things. The first was that we used predefined scenarios and these scenarios were just common traffic encounters that cars might encounter every day. And then these traffic encounters would be triggered once the ego vehicle reaches a certain point. And then if there is a collision, then we would reset the vehicle after that collision. We also did some things to work on the synchronization of the simulation time. So here we just allowed ROS to be the only software instance to perform the tick operation. And we initiate all of the modules in a very strict order. And as you can see here, the score error range before we apply the determinism settings and after we apply the determinism settings is much larger than after we apply the determinism settings, the score error range was reduced. So here are the results from the very first competition that we had. As you can see, we had a variety of vehicles that they used, a variety of tracks and a variety of different traffic scenarios. And so we had the baseline controller shown here and our human driver shown here. And actually our winner was able to get pretty close to the human driver in some of these scenarios, which is very exciting. So in conclusion, we introduced GRACE as a framework to benchmark various different decision and control problems. We also introduced an automated testing pipeline and we can run controllers concurrently and get results from that. And we can also get more deterministic tests. So for the next steps, we would like to aim for some more automation and deterministic testing in our testing pipeline. So right now we have to manually upload our submissions to the cloud, but maybe in the future we can have the competitors do that directly. We're also thinking of using different simulators for Grace. So we want to maybe use uh, quad rotors in the future. So we're looking at maybe using something like AirSim. And we're thinking of maybe changing the style of competition to a hackathon. So right now the competitors had a month, but maybe they should to just have a click hackathon style competition. And then finally, we're thinking of incorporating perception data into the controller interface. So we provide both the ground truth data as well as some LIDAR data for perception based controllers. So I want to say thank you to the Grace team and thank you all for listening today. Yeah, and thank you for presenting and for being here today. Thank you very much. And yeah, thank you very much to all of the speakers and to uh, thank you very much for contributing all the papers. I think, Madhur, we still have a little bit of time for a Q&A, right? OK. Um, yeah. yeah. So I'm checking the Q&A. Uh, not so many, many questions. Actually, so let, me, let, me, let me kick it off with a question for Greg, because it's fresh in, the, in my memory. So this is a very interesting uh, setup you have where you have uh, different scenarios which are sort of choreographed and you have to you know find your way around them i'm curious if you have considered flipping the model where someone submits a controller and someone else generates a scenario which causes that controller to crash right so so can you open the api such that instead of submitting controllers i can submit situations yeah, I actually think that would be a very interesting thing to do because we really wanted Grace to be kind of a framework that we communicate with the community and try to come up with these different benchmarks that can be used in autonomy. So I think that's a very uh, interesting direction to take. Yeah, it's like almost like an adversarial submission to someone's good controller. Um, anyways, that was that was just the thought on top of my head. Yeah, Johannes, go ahead. Yeah. 
Now, additional question here for Christina. Um, so currently you're relying completely on cloud computation, right? So yeah. someone with a simple laptop probably uh, cannot run your setup because you're heavily GPU based because of the color simulation, right? Yeah, so right now um, we are running all of the races on a server that we have, um, but if the competitors wanted to um, create their own controllers, then they would need to have that sort of laptop, but we could probably make some sort of cloud-based computation available in the future so that people with um, not as powerful laptops could also participate in the competition. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So um, I have a question. Um, I think that's also a question Q&A. Like a lot of research was based on simulation. Why not use real platforms such as F110s? I would flip the question and ask the, the two speakers, uh, Tony and Joy Deep, you use the F110's car. Uh, what was your experience with the vehicle? Um, and in addition, have you plans and possibilities perhaps to transition your code to a bigger car? And what did you learn from simulation and then put it on the car? Perhaps you tell us a little bit more about your experience from simulation and real car with F110's. And perhaps uh, Joy Deep, you can start, and then we get uh, Tony's answer about that. Sure. Um, I, I do want to mention that we did start off, of course, uh, in simulation to verify, you know, simple things like your kinematics are reasonable, reasonably match reality and all. But we quickly, as we started pushing the limits of uh, high-speed driving off-road, we moved into real worlds, and we didn't really touch simulation that much. And the reason for that is quite simple which is that modeling the kind of effects that you see when you're driving at high speed off-road, it's very hard to simulate. We don't have good simulators for them. And at the end of the day, we want them to work well in the real world. So we felt it was important to, uh, to devote time there. And to answer your question about, have we looked into going into larger vehicles? Uh, th that's actually true. We're actually in the process of uh, building a scale one fifth uh, and that will allow us to both have more compute, more sensors and maybe higher speed. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tony. Uh, okay, so uh, for my answers, I, uh, I have to mention into two sections. Uh, first section is because when we're using this uh, deep recruitment data-driven controls, the main idea is, is um, you don't really need to know the full scales of the vehicle parameters. You don't need a coronary stiffness. You don't need a center of gravities. And all of these things is based on the other people's uh, operations. And you learn from this operation, use this operation to learn the vehicle dynamics. So well, this, this approach can work perceptually, uh, exceptionally well in the real applications. It can show its real powers because you don't know. Um, in, the, in the real vehicles, you're probably finding a hard time to get all the testing done. Sometimes it can be difficult. And also even in some like a, a very strange situation, like in the rains or different places, you will know, find this hard time to get the real uh, useful data. So that's first things. And the second thing is uh, when we try to deploy, when we run into simulations, um, because based on our simulations and the time is discrete. So everything is discrete time. So whatever you do, you can wait a while for it to, to accomplish, but in the real vehicles and it's continuous for at least in the real world, in the world that we can um, operate and control in is this um, in continuous state space. So we do find out that if you try to design your controllers and you do have to do some lot of, little bit of balance um, in the real world is you have to satisfy the certain updates of the, of the controller. You have to design your control um, to, to satisfy a, a control frequency updates. Otherwise the vehicle is not gonna be very stable. So, and that's one of, that's the other reason when in our research that we can actually, and you, you, even we use the lifted state space, we can choose a, a marginally lower uh, lifted dimensions so that we can actually set us by generating a satisfying uh, auto convex optimizations and uh, updated frequencies. In that case is um, we can actually make the vehicles travel at, at, a, at a safely safe and a stable situations. And that's, so that's my answer. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Um, additional questions regarding the topic from anyone? Well, F110 also makes for a good background, so I encourage everyone to use one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to use the, the, F, the one to 10th cars. Yeah. Um, I have a question for, for Tim. Um, you, you told us that your, your research is uh, in the beginning, yeah? We saw some preliminary results. Um, and we saw good behavior of your car. 
So you incorporated um, that the opponent vehicle should just move once. So my question is, did you also try to let the other vehicle do something randomly and just um, just to get some feeling for your for your results and for your algorithms? Like, do you know where maybe your um, stochastic MPC gets into some difficult situations? Or do you think, yeah, stochastic MPC can that handle too, but it needs a little bit more improvement? Perhaps you can tell us a little bit more about that. So great question, actually. Um... The thing is, once you once you let the target vehicle or the, the vehicle in front of you do anything, it becomes very difficult to overtake in the first place if you um, allow them to have same accelerations and steering angles and whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, so this was one of the reasons why we basically also had this uh, one move blocking thing. We actually made the, the vehicle in front of us a little slower, so we were able to overtake. But um, technically, we, we can, or the GP is great at also um, providing information of, of multiple moves that the, that the other vehicle might make as long as, um, of course, it's not super random and um, yeah. as long as there is some um, reproducibility. But in, in general, yes, the, the framework is capable of handling this. Mm -hmm. But we specifically wanted to incorporate this one move rule because it's more, it's even more difficult to handle this one, it seems, than, than just uh, continuous uh, motion by the other vehicle. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's what what I've seen from my from my perspective in a lot of races. What the race driver is doing, just trying to figure out what is the next behavior of the other vehicle, and perhaps over a few few laps, getting to know this behavior and then applying it to their own path planning. That's the dream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's absolutely the dream. Okay. Um, perhaps an additional question here for for Jayant. Um, you saw um, now the the presentation of, um, is he still here? No, dropped out. Okay, dropped out, yeah, that's fine. Then we, then we, we skip this question. Um, then I have another question uh, for Joy Deep. Um, when you said you're localizing vehicle, I think you said you're just using the state estimation, right? Right, for localize, I mean, first, for we don't need global state estimation. We only need local local state estimation to understand like how the vehicle is actually moving uh, yeah. to gather the the, the training data. Mm -hmm. So, so just to to we heard a lot about GPS today. Wouldn't it be better to use an actual like indoor GPS or the small scale GPS that we can use on the F one tens cars to verify your algorithm a little bit better, or do you just say like? No, because I use the state estimation that might be bad, but I learned this behavior afterwards. Actually, can so I tackle can I tack on that, a quick that, addition to that question? Uh, yeah, really yeah, of course. So we, some of these IMUs that you have come with like an AHRS that have a built-in filter, what have you. So did you consider uh, using those? Yeah, so these are good questions. And in fact, these touch upon things which we're investigating right now. So let's see. Let's see. So the HRS, uh, yes, we have investigated that. There is a trade-off between smoothing versus fidelity. Uh, there's there's some amount of trade-off going, going on over there. And sometimes you find a slightly better result just feeding like the raw data rather than like f smoothing them, the, feeding them the smooth data. Uh, with regards to having additional structured sensors, which are not uh, necessarily using onboard perception, we're definitely interested in that. I think our constraints are uh, whatever we use, it needs to be uh, it, it needs to be capable of being set up in uh, on the fly on uh, not in a lab environment in uh, like a forest environment or something. So to that end, like, for example, we're looking at the Intel tracking camera because that might provide an off the shelf, uh, very high fidelity uh, navigation. And, and I believe uh, David A's group as actually has uh, good results with that as well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, Madur, we still have time. Uh, Hugo just wrote, so let me check. Yeah, because we can we can use another seven yeah. seven minutes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, um, perhaps Christina, another question for you uh, was about the open source of of the Greg software. So, what kind of tools are open source? Are you going to do to to make everything open source? What's your what's your future plans with that? 
Yeah, so everything right now is open source. And I think I put in the little answers tab a link to the GitHub where you can download mm -hmm. everything for Grace and install it for yourself. Um, we also wanted to make this open source because we wanted to use this for verification in the future. And so, yeah, we really, we really want it to be as open source as possible. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Um, and then we have uh, another question uh, from someone uh, in the in Audity. Um, yeah, have any of the folks uh, who are skipped simulation using their driving data from real vehicles to build simulations? Would we need to have a high fidelity F110 simulator? Um, I'm not sure if someone actually skipped the simulation. From what I know, everyone is starting with a simulation. Please correct me here if someone did that. Um, but from what I know, every one uh, of you used the simulation platform uh, beforehand and then moved on to the vehicle, right? Okay. I think that's a great question, actually. But And we've been thinking about that a little bit because we've been learning the inverse kinodynamic function. In some sense, to have a good simulator, you need to simulate the forward kinodynamic function. But yeah. you also need to correlate that with what uh, aspects of the world state does that depend on? Because in some sense, uh, when you're learning the inverse kinodynamic function, you skip that step. You don't need to reason about like why that's being caused. In simulation, you need to have a cause and effect. Like you need to say that if the uh, the current terrain in front of, front of the car is mud, hence uh, the the model would get modified by some method. Yeah. So it it could be done. It needs a little bit more than just doing the flip side learning. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I see a question by Sayan. I think it's a very uh, relevant question to a lot of what we are doing, which is that there is no specification for the rules of racing, right? There's no formal specification for what is blocking, what is defensive maneuver, what is a valid overtake. And so what he's asking is there are various rules in racing, but you know, can someone point us towards a resource that as a community we can we can almost like benchmark that this is the, the spec for racing that whether it's the real vehicle or simulation uh, that you will be evaluated on that this is the spec for safety. It's a very tough ask. Um, so I can share some thoughts because this is a thing that the teams who are participating in the Indy challenge also struggled with. We are trying to race multiple cars on the track and without any formal rules of what is allowed and what is not allowed, we risk a pile up leading to turn one. Uh, come October. So, so let me share maybe one instance of how we go about defining these rules. It's almost like a case by case basis. So teams upload sort of their videos of what their agents are doing against each other. And then the racing steward or the organizers, they will leave comments on who's at fault. Because a lot of this is very subjective, right? So here you can say the orange car is disqualified because it initiated some contact. So if we replay this again, the orange was on its line and then it just kind of squeezed the white card and without, without any kind of, you know, uh, it wasn't perturbed to do so. So it's at fault. So similarly, you can see there's a long list of multiple situations um, and then teams are always adding these simulations and asking if this happens during the race, who will be at fault? Of course, if you just ram into the barrier or crash into the car from behind, it's your fault, but sometimes it's not clear uh, at who is behaving in this uh, erroneous manner versus who is sticking to their race line. So it's very ill post, um, but it's, um, you know, one thing that we aim to solidify come October is publish some of these rules uh, to the community. And the other thing quickly, if I can share one more I instance. Can you say something, Mother, while you're- Of course, that? of course. It's interesting uh, that, you know, what you're saying could almost be considered labeling of poor behavior, which could itself be a learning problem. That, yeah, that I think automatically the, the, flags up, brings up candidates for uh, these poor scenarios for flat, for uh, adjudication by your right, your- right, we could build some runtime monitors that will clip this part of the race and present it to some human to play the blame game or something. Um, the other thing I want to say is that some of this is already on pen and paper. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to share this or not, but I, I'll take the risk. This is just a rule set from the Indie Autonomous Challenge. So we are you know, trying to define 
what are these behaviors? And they are adapted from real racing rules. So they're not just made up. Um, and you know, so we define what is avoidable contact, when will you be given a penalty, what is considered blocking, what is considered valid move to defend your position, so on and so forth. Uh, so there are rules about going out of bounds at different points in the track. Uh, what penalties are associated if your car rolls over in the simulation that tends to happen because the turns are banked. So some cars will just um, become uh, drones momentarily. Uh, mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, thought which has gone into collisions because that's the big one that who's is at fault when it, when a collision occurs. So in the simulation, it's easy because you can restart. But the simulation is also deterministic. Um, so if you just restart, you'll see the same collision again. Uh, so what we end up actually doing is we remove the car at fault and then restart without that car in place so that the race can progress for other cars. Um, so Sayan, yeah, it's a very interesting question. We don't have a, a spec yet, but uh, hopefully this is something that all of us can work on, on together. And, and what Madhur wants to say is each team needs a lawyer, definitely, to, <laughs> to figure out who's, whose fault is it at the end. <laughs> no, you just need someone to pay the lawyers. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to mention like this, uh, this notion of uh, defining who's at fault. There is some similarity between uh, that in racing and in uh, robot soccer as well. So I'm, uh, I'm involved with the small size league in robot soccer where the robots move extremely fast. And especially in places like the defense era, you'd really need to know whether it was the offending team, offense team, which was at fault or defending team. So uh, this has been encoded into several of the rules. Um, so I encourage you to look at that. Yeah, that, that's a great suggestion. All right. Um, I think if there are no answers open, I think we answered them in the Q&A. I ask all my questions. Then again, I would say thank you very much for being here today. Thank you very much for submitting your paper and presenting your awesome work. I was very happy to see all this research and yeah. Thanks again for being here today. And please stick around uh, because we just have one more session left. Uh, we yeah. have two really good talks, but uh, stick around till the end of the Q&A after that session and uh, concluding remarks because we'll also announce uh, uh, best paper winner awards for the contributed paper talks that we, that we heard from today. So uh, yeah, let's thank all the speakers and uh, we can now proceed with the final invited session.